Leif Eskesen, Leif Eskesen, HSBC's chief economist for India and the Southeast Asian region. Now, before joining HSBC, he was a senior economist at the International Monetary Fund. Leif worked at the IMF's headquarters in Washington for almost 10 years. And Leif is with us now. Thank you so much for joining us. It's the first time that actually we have such a huge financial gathering in China. And it's going to be very interesting because this was called by President Sarkozy to talk about currencies. It's just lasting one day. Are we going to make any progress or is it just an attempt to show you know, the world that France wants a new Bretton Woods agreement? I mean, I think we're not going to see a lot in terms of uh, progress on that. I think it's really uh, a first step in, in, uh, towards the bigger meetings that are going to come later in the year. I mean, clearly these uh, currency issues are going to be on the agenda. And, and it's, you know, it's an ongoing debate, I think. But I don't think we're going to see a lot in terms of uh, a new steps and measures out of this. When will China actually start to do a little he bit of headway and you know, start to not control its foreign exchange market so much? We've had a little bit of talk again that they're just becoming a little bit more flexible. Yeah, I mean, I think it will continue to be a gradual process uh, going ahead, basically. I think it's important to keep in mind that at the end of the day, China is still very much an export-driven economy. Mm -hmm. So they will be careful about how much they allow their exchange rate to appreciate. Uh, and they really want to rebalance their economy over the medium term. So in a sense, starting to build up the domestic sources of growth in the economy over the medium term. It takes time because it requires really structural reforms and structural changes to the economy. So in the meantime, they would allow for more gradual appreciation of the exchange rate uh, to allow this transition to happen. Life, how important is it that it's one of the first G20 meetings in a BRIC country? I know you focused a lot on inflation and food inflation, yeah. especially in India. Yeah. Uh, is it going to be, you know, until now we've talked about regulation, we've talked about the bankers, we've mm -hmm. talked about problems that the West has had during the financial crisis. Yes. Are we going to see much more of a give and take relationship amongst the G20 countries? I think it is an important signal as well, and I think it's important for the governance of, of institutions like G G20 that you have uh, included meetings in, in emerging economies to also show that they have an important stage uh, on the world political uh, stage, basically. So I think it is an important signal, and I think it will actually still uh, sh begin to shape also the agenda of G20 to be, to be broader, because otherwise the G20's legitimacy uh, cannot be upheld if we don't have a broad representation also of the issues that are discussed. And how concerned are you about inflation and the impact that that's having, of course, on a lot of the emerging economies? Yeah. I mean, inflation is a big issue. It's a big issue in Asia more generally as well. Um, you alluded to some it relates to food inflation, but that's just part of the story. I mean, the food uh, inflation story relates to weather-related factors, uh, natural disasters as well, and that obviously lifts up food. And that's also concerning in itself. Uh, why? Because uh, food is a big part of the consumption basket in Asian countries. So food prices stay elevated for a while. It can sort of gradually spill over to, to broader inflation expectations, to higher yeah. wage demands, etc. Then it becomes a broader inflation problem. But I also think in, in Asia more generally, you have to keep in mind that Asia recovered very, very rapidly from the global crisis. So basically the slack that was in the economy immediately after the crisis evaporated late last year. So what we have now is that they're starting to see demand-led pressures building up in the economy because they're essentially operating above their potential. Mm -hmm. So that is building up core inflation and that's an, uh, a concern for monetary policy makers. That's why we see a need for a lot more monetary tightening across Asia this year. But at the same time, of course, all of this food inflation is underpinned by the price of oil. I wonder whether, I know in India, for example, food yeah. inflation has toppled more than one government. Yeah. When you look at what's happening in the Middle East, yeah. now these were not very democratic states. Right. That's a given. Yeah. But at the same time, a lot of the revolutions were actually you know, flared up because of food inflation. Yes. Is there a worry that you have that this may translate it further east in Asia or is just yeah. just rubbish? Yeah. No, it, it certainly is a concern. I think that probably the regime and uh, the, 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 the policy setups are more stable uh, across Asia, more broadly speaking, I would say. But clearly, I think a lot of the governments, they are concerned about it. For example, you've had protests in India because of high food prices. And as you mentioned, it had been tied up with, with a changing government in the past. But, but uh, I think what happened in India back then was not necessarily just related to food prices. It was just the population uh, thought at the time that uh, the government's growth agenda was not sufficiently inclusive. And they saw the high food prices at, this, at the time of that as symptomatic of that as well. So I think it was a broader issue yeah. back then in India's case. But, but clearly, the rise 
rising food prices and if you have populations that are very dependent on it and uh, of course it, it hurts. Yeah, and it's always going to cause a little bit of social unrest. That's Life, right. Thank you so much. Life Pleasure. Eskison there.